This is Support is Sexy, episode 308, with Regina Gwynn, CEO and co-founder of TressNoir.com. Welcome to Support is Sexy. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I interview inspiring women entrepreneurs who share their wins and their lessons to help you take your business and your life to the next level and create something sexy. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Happy Monday if you're listening to this in real time and welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm so happy to have you here. It just would not be the same without you. And if you're ready to make a bold move in your business or in your personal life, but you feel like you need a little support and a solid plan that I want you to go to makebravedecisions.com for my free course on how to make brave decisions. Now, today I'm excited to welcome our guest, Regina Gwynn, and Regina is the co-founder and CEO of an innovative company called TressNoir.com. I know you're going to enjoy this. Tons of great information about launching a technology company that also satisfies a need in the beauty space, especially for women with textured hair. So Regina is here to talk to us about starting TressNoir.com, where it came from, what that pain point was, and she shares with us why she believes there is value in corporate experience prior to entrepreneurship, the importance of having an advisory board, why you need an accountability partner who's willing to poke holes in your ideas. You don't want a yes woman, right? You want someone who's not afraid to say, but what about this? Did you think about that? Also, Regina shares why she's an advocate for partnership when starting your business and how to hold your own and tailor your story for investors. And Regina gives us great insight about pitching to investors to raise money. And she also appeared on Queen Boss, which is a show on Centric, where she stood in front of a panel pitching her idea and did so on television. She shares the lesson that she learned in that experience too. All right, so I know you're going to enjoy this episode. So without further ado, Regina Gwynn. So, Regina, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to get to chat with you. Sounds great. I am excited to be here, Elaine. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. My pleasure. Now, first question, when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? Okay. So, my dad was the first entrepreneur that I ever met. Um, He owned a recycling firm in Greensboro, North Carolina, And just watching him growing up, I knew I wanted to do something in business, but I also had this creative streak. So uh, Gem and the Holograms was my favorite cartoon. Gem and the Holograms. Yes, yes. (laughs) And she and Gem was a fashion designer. And I said, I've got to be in the fashion industry. I had every W, Vogue, Vanity Fair, Glamour, Mademoiselle magazine you could possibly imagine. Um, And so I knew I wanted to do something in fashion and beauty. I mean, I I was actually remembering this a a couple of weeks ago that I used to sell Avon um, because they didn't have an age requirement. I was in I don't know, middle school, you know, selling Avon to my teachers. <laughs> How did you get access? Oh, my goodness. How did you get instead of lemon instead of a lemonade stand? You you had right. Avon. How did you get Avon. access to selling Avon? Did you go to your parents and say, this is what I want to do? And they said, OK, this, this is what my mom took me to the sales meetings. And what? I sat. Yeah, I had my I had my my brochures, my pamphlets with the little samples and I would put them on the doors and, you know, I would talk to my my middle school teachers and they would buy the, you know, the eyeshadow and the 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 eyebrow. I remember the eyeliners used to be popular, the blue and the orange and the green. So what? Oh, my yeah. goodness. So you had your own business. At, how old were you at this point? I, oh, goodness. Middle what school. Was, about I 12 remember or so. Yeah, somewhere around 12, 11, 12 years old. Um, just always hustling, you know, selling candy in the band. <laughs> this I love is it. So long ago. <laughs> Enterprising. Now, what do you think those experiences did, or, or how do you think, I should say, those experiences have shaped who you are today? So um, it really helped me understand the importance of being self sufficient um, really early on. I loved being able to have money to get 
you know, the candy at the candy store and, you know, having money to go buy clothes in the mall or, you know, just being able to, to know that, you know, every penny that I, I earned, I, I got to keep my mom said, you know, if you want to do this, then, you know, don't ask me for money because, you know, you're, you're making your own. So, so that idea of, of really being independent, um, was, was something that, you know, I was exposed to. And once you get a taste of that, then, you know, you, you, you definitely want to do more. Um, and so, you know, when I went to, um, you know, went to college and then went to, to business school, um, entrepreneurship was always something that was my my end goal. You know, I knew I needed to get the experience in corporate America, but I knew it wasn't going to be my final resting place. Now, where did you grow up? So I'm a, I'm born and raised in North Carolina, um, grew up. Well, I was born in Fayetteville, North Carolina and grew up in the Raleigh, Durham area. And loved it. You know, I, I look back on it now and I was bored to tears. <laughs> I, will, I will definitely say I wanted the bright lights, the big city. My mom is from the Bronx. So we would come up to New York, you know, in, in the summertime and I would never want to leave. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was just that hustle and bustle and and the, the sounds of the city at night. Um, so so definitely wanted to to get up here. But I also liked you know, climbing trees, running around barefoot, (laughs) you know, um, I would climb trees and read a book. So, yeah, it was, it was interesting. Who would you say were some of your greatest influences growing up? That's a good question. Um, so, you know, my, my parents were huge influences in, in my life. Um, you know, I definitely, both of them very, very active, involved, um, you know, I had a really, I have a really good relationship with my mom. My dad passed away, um, earlier this year, mm, um, but no worries. Um, so, you know, just seeing how hard they worked and instilling that hard work ethic, um, was something that I saw, you know, my mom used to braid my hair, you know, when I was asleep, you know, before she'd go to work, you know, it's mm-hmm. like the, old, the, the consummate working woman. She was a, a nurse at Duke University Medical Center. And, you know, that idea of juggling everything while, you know, taking care of herself, taking care of her children, um, and still working was something that, you know, again, I I look back and say, wow, you know, my mom was was doing a lot, and and dad was doing a lot to to provide for us. And so I definitely think that, you know, seeing both of them, um, you know, have a a level of success in their, you know, respective careers, definitely raised the, you know, it, it's, it set the bar and, and I was, you know, definitely expected to, to, to succeed that. Um, so, so that's what I've tried to do and, and continue to, to do as well as at this point, you know, I mean, I'm definitely influenced by just some of the badass chicks in, in the game right now in terms of, you know, um, Bozema St. John is, you know, killing it at, mm-hmm. at when she was at Apple and she was at Pepsi, she was at Uber, she's at Uber now, you know, um, you know, Issa Rae, you know, there, there's just something about this black girl magic that continues to reinforce itself um, that I, I feel very blessed to, to, to just be, you know, a, a chocolate girl these days. Yes. What a time to be alive, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> what would you say? Because it sounds like, um, well, from what you said, that entrepreneurship, even if you didn't know exactly what it was called at that time, was definitely a part of who you are. What do you mm-hmm. think you're where do you think you got that from? Was it just in you? Because uh, your parents were working at different places and had careers and working hard. But it sounds like yeah. did you have examples of that or where did you get, for example, the idea to sell Avon? You know, that's. Uh, uh, you know, I probably, so, you know what, probably, so I'm pretty sure someone left an Avon bag on our doorstep one Mm. day and I'm flipping through the brochure and I'm reading the back of it and it says you can sell Avon. So I'm sitting here thinking, well, I can sell Avon. Avon. (laughs) (laughs) If anyone could, I mean, I definitely believe if anyone can do it or if she can do it over there, I damn sure can do it. Mm -hmm. And I bet you I can do it better. You know, that's you, that having just a level of confidence um, and instilling that idea that, anything is possible. You know, when I told my dad that I wanted to go into the fashion industry, he didn't bat an eye, Mm. you know, country girl from North Carolina (laughs) going to to New York to pursue, you know, a career in retail. He said, okay, but you better be good. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and that was it. So I was like, Oh, well, I guess I better be good. (laughs) Better be good. Now, did you go to New York? Is that where you went to college? 
So um, I started off at uh, Fashion Institute of Technology, mm -hmm. FIT, mm -hmm. um, and was a fashion buying and merchandising major. Um, did a year at, at FIT before transferring to Rutgers University. Um, and so, you know, the reason why I transferred was, you know, I loved the 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 classwork. I, you know, I loved kind of being exposed to those tenets of like product uh, product development, merchandising. But I also knew that I still wanted kind of like that business experience as well. And I also just wanted a college experience, you know, growing up at, you know, going to Duke, you know, going on to Duke University's campus and friends are at NC State and Carolina. And here I was, you know, in the heart of the city at the limelight, which, you know, not not to say anything you know, bad about that that experience. But I just wanted kind of like that true college life type mm -hmm. of that type on of the campus life. kind of experience. Yeah. There you go. So I transferred to Rutgers. And um, so that's kind of what brought me to New Jersey. Did you still continue to study fashion merchandising at or fashion at Rutgers? So um, so the Rutgers didn't have a fashion program um, mm -hmm. at the time. I think they're building out more of like a business of fashion degree now. But I, I used my FIT student ID to sneak on campus for the career fairs. I love it. So <laughs> I would... <laughs> So I would do, you know, I'd, I'd be at Rutgers and because, you know, again, at the time, the business school at Rutgers was all about accounting. So, you know, if I wanted to do accounting, if I wanted to be in like general management and things of that nature, they had a great career um, career office. But I, you know, still kept in contact with my friends at FIT. They would let me know when the career fairs were. And that's actually how I ended up um, getting my internship at Macy's, which turned into an offer. And I was at Macy's Inc. for uh, seven years before going to business school. Okay, so I was going to ask you the first position after school, because you mentioned that that was something that you knew you wanted to do, even though you had entrepreneurship on the brain was you wanted yes. to work in a corporation first. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I um, so I, I did the uh, merchant um, Lord, the product development um, internship at Macy's Merchandising Group, which at the time, well, at the time it was federated. So I'm telling my age here. But um, <laughs> I remember <laughs> that. Yeah. So federated department stores, um, you know, ran Macy's, Bloomingdale's, um, Stearns, if anyone remembers that. Mm -hmm. um, and so they had their merchandising group, which was responsible for their private label brands. So if you think of Charter Club, Inc. International Concepts, Club Room, Alfani, Tasso Elba, these are all brands that are um, developed and designed by kind of like Macy's employees, but they're marketed and presented to the consumer as if they're like a Ralph Lauren or a Hugo Ball. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, Calvin now Klein. that I didn't know. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I was in dress accessories and was responsible for um, like wraps. That's when pashmina started to trend. Right. Um, it was all about, you know, um, so dress accessories included handbags, um, neckerchiefs, rain wear, sunglasses, hats. Uh, and cold weather. So like mitts, uh, mittens, scarves, wraps, things like that. And I loved it. You know, it was really getting a true um, introduction to retail 101. It's some, one thing to actually learn it in a textbook or in a class, but it's another thing when you're actually in buyer meetings, you know, with the buyers, merchandisers and planners talking about mapping out what product is going to hit the floor you know, nine months from now. And, you know, fashion is completely different now. There is no more nine months, you know, merchant manufacturing cycle, you know, with fast fashion, H&M, mm -hmm. Zara, like you're getting it in a month. <laughs> you right. might as well get it the same day, you know, that, that you see it on the, on the runway. So, um, so I was there, I started off in dress accessories and then I moved into the marketing department, um, focusing on menswear. So um, went from ready to wear to the men's team and worked on, um, marketing for Inc. International Concepts for Men. Um, I got to help launch that brand in 2003. Um, got to launch American Rag, which is a juniors and young men's brand in 2005. So definitely got a taste of like all things fashion, all things marketing, really understanding how to tell a story. Um, what is that consumer insight that you need in order to kind of position it in their minds that this is this this cashmere program is worth seventy nine ninety nine? I'll buy three of them, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, so that that part was cool, but um, I just kind of felt like there was still something more. You know, I didn't know what, but I knew I wanted more of a data driven analytical 
framework for why we were making our marketing decisions. And that's what prompted me to go to, to business school. Now, would you say, because a lot of our listeners are at different stages of their business, some have already launched, some have a side hustle, some are in the early yep. stages or thinking about it. And some of my listeners, too, are in school and college and looking mm. at what's next. And they say, you know, studies show now entrepreneurs, uh, excuse me, millennials are starting businesses younger than any generations before at like 27 sure. or so. So yep. with all that said, I would ask you, do you think, would you advise um, people who may be in college or looking at the next thing to get that? Uh, corporate experience before mm. jumping into entrepreneurship or what was the benefit for you? It sounds yeah. like you learned a lot during that time you were there. Absolutely. And I actually am a big proponent of getting some kind of corporate experience before starting just for the simple fact that you get to learn on somebody else's dime. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know the, a lot of the projects that I've had an opportunity to work on have been brand launches. So, you know, I got to learn how to launch a brand without using any of my money. As a matter of fact, I got paid. You know, that right. was, this was my job to launch American Rag. It was my job to figure out, you know, what partnerships should we be pursuing within music, which I think is still one of the kind of core tenets of the American Rag brand today. So um, I, I, de I definitely think it's worth, even if it's, you know, even if you hate it. I mean, I think even if it's two years, three years, it's worth doing it because <laughs> you will you'll lose you'll waste a lot of money like in the grand scheme of things there you you won't know that you're wasting it you won't know that it's you know that that it, this won't be a great and perfect strategy until it's over but the more you can learn on somebody else's dime the better and i always tell people you can do anything for a year yeah <laughs> you can absolutely. Do it. it goes by so you can, fast you will right you will blink your eyes and a year will be gone mm -hmm. and you know no harm no foul right. you and meanwhile you can be building your business you can be working on your side hustle you can be refining your business plan it's not to say that your business won't advance because you're you know you're doing this this corporate stint but i definitely think it it will it can go even that much more further so when you decided to go to business school did you know uh, what you had in mind to do after business school? Did you have an idea for your business at that time or was it just nope. you wanted to learn more? Nope. <laughs> yep. Nope. Had no idea. I had Rent no, Elaine, I had no idea I was going to be doing what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like none whatsoever. It found me. <laughs> Tell, oh, that's um, excellent. Tell us how you got there. First, where did you go to business school? Okay. I went to um, Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern out okay. in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And then what, when did the idea then for Tress Noir come about? Okay. So come, come to you, we should say. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, crazy. We, so my business partner and I were on vacation and <clears throat> we're on the beach looking out into the sea, you know, trying to figure out our lives, not wanting to go back to work. Um, and, um, my, my, my business partner, Octavia says, you know, wow, you know, what is the thing that we both know? Well, we both know hair. Um, you know, we, I've been natural since college actually. So this was like before the huge natural hair movement that mm -hmm. we see today, you know, this was when there was no, you know, no social media, uh, yeah, like none actually. Um, so like there, what year uh, about early two thousands or, uh, 96, 96. <gasps> Love yeah. it. Okay. Yeah, child. So, so I remember kind of, I literally went on an adventure to find that one Carol's daughter store in Brooklyn, you know, in a, like one dark night just mm -hmm. to find one natural hair product because there, there was no Shea Moisture. There was no, um, I don't know, Camille Rose curls, like there's so many different choices now. And I was learning at the time where you just really had to do trial and error. And it was and, and that was it. So so just having always had um, had that experience, uh, you know, kind of seeing this entire um, product and, and movement come and appear in front of us we both look at each other and we're like, wow, like the styling experience has stayed the same. We're both frustrated at going in hair salons. You're there all day. You bring your, I mean, I was bringing my Wi-Fi, laptop, food, water, books, pens, paper, you know, because you were just, you just knew that that was, that, that was just the behavior that you were used to. Um, and, and so we said, okay, well, we do, we need to do something in hair. And then we also wanted to have some way for technology to power this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of combining, you know, beauty and hair and hair styling in particular 
um, with this on-demand culture. It's like Uber, we, we wouldn't exist if Uber wasn't general practice. We now are comfortable in getting into someone's random car and expecting them to take us from point A to point B. Right. Um, so it wasn't until these other kind of on-demand technologies and and cult and um, norms uh, appeared that we said that this could actually even be something. So we just said, okay, well, let's just try it out and see what happens. So tell <laughs> us what tell the audience what Tres Noir is and does and how it works. Yes. Sure. So Trust Noir is an on-demand, on-location beauty booking app designed for women of color. So we reduced your salon wait time to zero by sending a traveling textured hair expert to your house, hotel, or office to do your hair. Um, we essentially allow you to book an appointment online, give us your location of service. We offer a wide array of hairstyles from um, you know, two strand twists to cornrows to braids, locks, sew-in weaves, crochet sets, and more. Um, and we really focus on healthy hair care regimens. So that means that we're curating the network of hairstylists to those that are licensed beauty professionals that are really interested and, and passionate about natural hair and, to, and all different types of hair textures. So we're essentially trying to give women back their time by having, you know, that that those that quality styling that gets you in and gets you out. You're not on YouTube at three o'clock in the morning trying to figure it out yourself. Right, right. You're letting the, the experts do it for you. Wow. So they come the the stylist comes to my house and yes. I choose the style that I want so they have an idea before they get there what style I'm expecting. Absolutely. And you can text us or email us your hair inspiration. Uh, we're happy to we do phone consults prior to with the hairstylist to see if there's something in particular that you need. Uh, we also work with those that have um, sensitive skin and you know problem areas like you know possibly hair breakage or alopecia due to um, extended uh, weave use. So uh, we also kind of uh, support that community as well. That's amazing. Now, what was the first step for you once you decided that this was something you were going to try? What was the first step for you and your business partner when you said, OK, let's do this now. Let's yes. fill in the blank. Yes. So first things first was was research. What do, what does the competitive landscape look like? Um, who's out here doing it already? Why hasn't this been done already? Mm -hmm. You know, what what is it going to take to make our make Trust Noir different from anything else that was out on the market? And, you know, the, the that first cut was, you know, looking at some of these concepts and saying, OK, why aren't they working for us? So we looked at, you know, dry bar, blow bar, glam squad. These were um, styling concepts that are, you know, quick and quick service, easy, uh, low cost, but they only focused primarily on blowouts. So we're like, oh, OK, well, what if you want two strand twists? What if you want cornrows? What if you want braids? Um, these services don't offer those types of hairstyles. So so we said, OK, well, that's something that we should offer. Um, and, and what about, you know, knowledgeable stylists, you know, that's something that we should offer. So, um, really understanding the, the, the landscape I think was number one. Um, and then number two was saying, okay, was the technology piece. So, you know, allow finding a booking platform or finding a booking engine, shall we say, that allows you to, um, to, to scale from market to market by price, um, you know, being able to be flexible with pricing, um, possibly adding surge pricing for last minute appointments. So, you know, kind of flesh mapping out what the technology scope would be, mm -hmm. what took a while. <laughs> it definitely imagine. took a while. And then what about um, recruiting your stylist? How did you assemble your team of, of stylists? Yes. So we all we, we definitely started with with the stylists that we knew. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we always went with, start with what you know. Start with what you know. Absolutely. So we actually started in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, Octavia has a great network of, of stylists, of people, of friends. And, and mind you, my business partner is a doctor. So she is completely separate at, from the, the business world. Right. But, um, you know, it was that she had that doctors, you know, female doctors in particular are time starved. They really need, um, you know, to have to be in and out quickly because their their schedules are just so hectic. So 
Um, so we use that as a test market uh, before, tr you know, entering into New York, which is definitely, you know, a bigger, um, a, uh, just a bigger stage. So um, so we, we, we went after stylists in the Philadelphia market that were either in salons or, um, you know, doing other things. So, you know, someone that was, you know, going back to school, but she was, she already had her license. And, you know, we also worked with a, a work with a stylist that um, is a teacher, but also, you know, was, was, was licensed and had, you know, worked in hair pr prior to, to, to going into education. So um, we, it really kind of ran the gamut and, you know, we really always wanted to have a stylist that we would want to do our hair. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it really came back to, you know, we definitely are the the customers, you know, we're not only the the clients, we're, you know, we're not only the president, we're, the, we're the, the client as well. Right. Um, and, you know, it, it, we, we knew we've, we've, because we've, you know, been in these salons for years, we know what good looks like. So, you know, we wanted to make sure that um, the stylists were not only technically skilled, but also had the customer service. And did you both invest in the company yourself in the beginning, yourselves yeah. in the beginning, or was it uh, investment as well from outside? Absolutely. We have definitely bootstrapped um, the, the bulk of the business mm -hmm. and put in, um, you know, definitely invested our own personal dollars uh, for the first definitely for the first year or so, um, before, you know, just to get it to a place that attracted um, additional investors. Nice. And now, so how long has it been officially up and running now? It's been officially up and running for almost three years. Three years. Yay. Congratulations. Yay. I love the concept when I heard about it. I love it. And then you're, you're <laughs> wonderful. So that's a bonus. Oh, uh, of course. So, um, so in addition to Philadelphia and are, have you expanded into New York now? We are in New York. What uh, other markets? Cover, yep, we cover Philly, New York, uh, the DMV area, and we're looking uh, towards the West Coast later on this year. Mm -hmm. What about the South? What about Atlanta? Atlanta, Atlanta's on our is definitely on our radar, mm -hmm. um, and and we know that just it's a it's such a huge beauty market in and of itself. Um, you know, we, we definitely have our eye on it. Mm -hmm. We're also starting to like get a better understanding of, of the market dynamics. So, you know, that high demand, low supply, um, you know, is, is, does it fit kind of like our blueprint for where we see success? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, Atlanta, you know, fits some of that criteria and we were, we have our eye on lots of markets. Mm -hmm. Now, how would you say the business is growing today or rather, what would you like to see as far as your vision for it? Mm. So definitely would like to just continue to increase penetration in the markets that we're currently in. You know, we could always be doing, you know, more more bookings in Philly, New York and DMV, um, while definitely looking towards um, national expansion. You know, we just got a few emails from Austin, Texas. We got email. We get emails from um, from Florida. So, you know, we, we could definitely see anywhere between five to 10 new markets per year over the next couple of years. And then eventually international expansion, you know, that this, this idea of textured hair is, is, you know, women of color are throughout the diaspora. And, you know, if you think of Paris, if you think of London, you know, one of the things that is amazing about living in the U.S. is that we have access to mm -hmm. so much more in terms of products, tools, education, expertise. Um, there is there's a huge demand um, for for that type of skill, for those types of skills um, overseas. And I, I'd love to, to kind of bring that um, bring that to life. And how does it work as far as the payment? Is that through the technology also or does the person pay the stylist once they're there? Is it like an Uber? Every, it goes through yep. all through the app all through the app. So mm -hmm. you um, store your credit card. Uh, you're not charged until the service is rendered. Um, you can add gratuity to that card as well, or mm -hmm. you can pay gratuity uh, by cash, you know, in person. But everything is done manual. Uh, sorry, everything is done through the app. You can also do recurring appointments. So for those girls that get blowouts every two weeks, you know, it's it's set it and forget it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we, we want to make it as easy and as simple and as seamless as possible. You know, we want to change perception that we that that our hair is hard to deal with. Our hair is unruly. Our hair is, you know, something that has to be a chore. It doesn't. It, it really, really doesn't. And I think for especially for our natural curly girls, you know, 
understanding your curls is half the battle, you know, and we, we all used to have, or, you know, some, most of us used to have chemical relaxers and that all, you know, allows our hair to perform the same way straight. Mm -hmm. Whereas now you've got, you know, I have super tight curls on the top of my head, loose curls on the back, a different texture on the side. (laughs) So, you know, so it takes time to understand, you know, what, what works for you and, and having a stylist that can help you, that can guide you through that process is what we're all about. What would you say has been the greatest um, support to you and your business partner for the business? Um, do you belong mm-hmm. to any incubators or did you do any kind of programs or things like that to learn more about, you know, what you had to do as a technology company? What's been, would you say, the greatest support? So we have gone through a couple of um, accelerators. We did the Philly Startup Leaders Accelerator Pro- Accelerator Program uh, in 2016, and that allowed us access to really great mentors and and people that we've added to our advisory board. And I think that having a strong advisory board is the key to all of this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Those, you know, men and women that keep you accountable, um, that ask you tough questions, that poke holes in your strategy, poke holes in your, holes in your thinking, I think is, is has been a, a huge help. Um, additionally, we also did the Google for Entrepreneurs exchange program for black founders last year. And our advisor from there, from that one week was like game changer. She was outstanding. Um, she's done this before. You know, you need someone that has gone through this process before that started from a seed and, you know, gone through to raise a series B round of funding like you, you de- especially for, you know, founders of color that haven't been exposed to this ecosystem before. You really have to have some folks on your side that can advocate for you, that can introduce you to investors, introduce you to resources. Um, and, and, and then, like I said, just like kind of help you think through the idea. You cannot do this alone. I think, Can't do it. yes, absolutely. support is sexy. That's right. Support. Can't do it alone. And, uh, and I think of what, one of the things you said that was powerful too, was the importance of having someone who will poke holes in your strategy or your absolutely. idea. Yeah. As opposed to, yes, yes, that's great. That's great. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no. I mean, uh, and, and shoot between me and Octavia and I, we poke holes in each other's. In Mm -hmm. in each other's strategy, you know, I one thing I think I have to say one of the things that that helped me get to where I am is having a partner. Um, I know Mm -hmm. sometimes entrepreneurs want to do it alone Mm -hmm. or, you know, just kind of it's really hard to start a business by yourself. And I agree with that. I, I agree with that. I wonder whether or not the reason why I hadn't started something sooner was because I just hadn't met Octavia. You know, or or whether, you know, I just hadn't gotten comfortable enough with someone to start something. Um, and, and I think that, you know, ha- I definitely think having a partner going into business with someone, A, just doubled the amount of money, you know, that mm-hmm. we were able to invest. And B, it, it, it gives you kind of an, an everyday uh, accountability partner and someone you want to go into business with someone who has different a different skill set than you do. Uh, you know, Octavia is OCD, operations all day long, you know, spreadsheet crazy. I'm strategy creative <laughs> in the clouds, thinking dreamer. Right. And, and, and that, and that works because she brings me down to the ground and I help her think about, you know, new, new possibilities and, and where we could go, where we could go from here. So, um, I think that the support comes in, in from lots of different places. Yes, I think that's such a great point, too, if either having a partner or if you don't have a partner, making sure you get someone who brings other skills to the table, even yep. as an advisor or something, right? Yep, absolutely. Where did yep. you two meet? Did you meet in school? No, we met through um, our sorority. Oh, okay. Excellent. Very good. Yeah. Now, yeah. I know that you um, also presented on Queen Boss, la- was that last year already? Was that oh, year? goodness. That was earlier this year. Earlier this year. OK. All right. So we taught this year. So yes. the Queen Boss on Centric, I think it is. Right. Yes. So tell us about um, what's the, what would you say is the most powerful lesson you learned from your experience being on on that show or or presenting in front of a panel, any kind of panel where you're presenting your idea to people and trying to make them yeah. understand it and invest in it. So I think the, the most um the most powerful lesson uh, that I learned from Queen Boss was, you know, always be prepared. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that there's there's something to be said about, you know, just, you know, owning owning your story, 
owning the, the, the value that you bring to the table, knowing that your business is great and being prepared for whatever may come. Um, and, you know, I think that the, the, the judges were, uh, gave me construct some constructive criticism, which I, you know, I took and, and it was, and it was overall, you know, a, a great experience. It was a learning experience around, um, being really creative and thinking on your feet. Mm -hmm. Um, we did not have a long period of time to figure out kind of how we were going to pitch to the investors. So, you know, kind of thinking about what that, how creative could I get, um, and, and how, you know, how creative could I get, but make sure that they really understood the value of the business was the goal. Um, and whenever you're pitching to the investors, it is about the value such that it's something that they would want to invest in. So how do you do that? You tell them a story. It, it should be a story that it, it addresses a humongous market and it should be a market that's ready to spend money. So, you know, how, how did I get that across? You know, hair, we all know women of color spend a ridiculous amount of money on it. It's a $7 billion ethnic hair care industry. So when you have those big numbers, it's something that, you know, investors can easily jump onto and they can do the math in their heads to say, oh, wow, this is an opportunity. Have you found that investors outside of Queen Boss, but just in general, do they get it when you explain um, exactly what the, the company does and why it's such a necessity, I feel like? Mm. So it definitely depends on the type of investor. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that um, most of the investors who look like me get it, um, but those who do not don't. Um, you know, I think it's just it's it's slowly changed the the. Um, hmm. The investor community is slowly changing um, and understanding that underserved and untapped markets represents a, a, a huge investment opportunity. Right. Um, but it is hard to wrap their minds around it because, you know, you've got you've you've just got very real obstacles around, you know, what people are comfortable in talking about and and just their their reference points. Um, you know, oftentimes you're talking to white men who don't have hair. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> that in and of itself is like, I have no idea what you're talking about. You they know, don't get the goes... hours in the salon and all those no. kind of references, right? No, no. They, they, all they know is they give money to their wives for their wives to go, you know, get their hair done. Um, so, you know, so it's, if it's not something that they themselves can personally reference or personally understand, um, it's sometimes a struggle. And oftentimes when you think about that 30 second elevator pitch, if you've spent, 29 of those 30 seconds just trying to explain the problem, let alone mm. the solution, then therein lies lies the the, the challenge. So um, it does take longer, you know, to to help them understand sometimes. But once they do, then you've you've got something. What have you found? And I know every experience is different, but just for people listening who are, might be in that sort of pitch phase in general, what do you find is the thing that sort of um, makes them get it? maybe not faster, but just get it. Do mm. you find, in other words, do you find that numbers, for example, is the story mm. that you'll tell to those kinds of investors as opposed to the hair experience in the salon mm. story? Do you cater your stories differently depending on who it is? Yes, definitely cater the story to, to who it is. Um, you know, talk numbers, but also at now we are at a place where we can start to talk reference points. So for example, Tristan Walker is the founder of a company called Walker & Co. Mm -hmm. And he recently received, I think around $15 million in investment from Andreessen Horowitz for his his first product, which was the, the Bevel brand. Right. Um, since then he's launched Form, which is a new um, women's beauty product brand for I think both for both natural and and chemically relaxed hair um, and so when you say Tristan's name it, it, he you know he is starting to become you know that example of a founder of color that is in the you know the hair care or, or personal um, per, uh, consumer packaged goods brand he wants to be essentially like the black Procter and Gamble so when you're able to provide some reference points for investors, um, regardless of color, but particularly for those that might be struggling with kind of like that salon pain point mm -hmm. um, explanation, then they get it. When you know, when you say Tristan Walker, they're like, okay, I get it. When you say, um, you know, um, 
Deshaun, in, in, uh, Deshaun from from Maven, they're like, OK, I get it. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, we need to raise up more founders of color and, and be able to point to them as examples of where your investment could go. And then they're like, oh, OK, got All it. Right. Tress Noir is going to be one of those examples. God willing. There. God willing. That's right. <laughs> Knocking on wood. Let's take a quick break to thank our sponsors. So if you're a solopreneur like me, you probably live by your schedule. You talk to people all around the world from clients to freelancers. For me, podcast interviews that I have to set up. So my schedule means everything. And that is why I use Acuity Scheduling. Acuity has been my savior for the past year. It helps me honestly keep my sanity. And I was excited to get the chance to talk to Kristen Barber, customer happiness specialist at Acuity, about just how the company goes about keeping their customers sane and happy. So Acuity Scheduling is an online scheduling software program really focused on helping small businesses focus on what matters to them. So we take a lot of the day-to-day minutia off of your hands. We set it up so that you can have all of your clients self-schedule in, manage their appointments, reschedule, cancel if something comes up. You didn't have to call them and do this awkward back and forth dance of what date and time work for you. If anything changes, they don't need to call and let you know. They can just handle that all on your own and you're kept up to date. And it takes so much work off your plate so that you can focus on either building your business up with other aspects that a scheduling program can't handle or go enjoy yourself. And as a special offer for Support is Sexy listeners, Acuity Scheduling is offering a 45-day free trial just for you. So go to acuityscheduling.com forward slash sexy. Again, that's A-C-U-I-T-Y scheduling.com forward slash sexy. And you can take advantage of any plan they have there for 45 days. At the end of that time, whatever plan you want to continue with, you can do that or you can stick with the free plan. Acuityscheduling.com forward slash sexy. We'll be keeping an eye out for you sexy ladies. And now back to the show. What would you say entrepreneurship has taught you about yourself as a woman? That is, uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Just give us a summary in like what, five minutes. Five minutes, three, three minutes. So what has entrepreneurship taught me about myself as a woman? That um, I'm stronger than I thought I was. Um, I have imposter syndrome, which you you don't think that you do, but you end up having Mm -hmm. um you know you you always are thinking like damn I could be doing better I should I should be doing more and from the outside everyone's like oh my god this business is so great and on the inside I'm like no you know like Mm -hmm. I I you know we you have those moments you absolutely have those days where you're just like I'm just frustrated (laughs) so um so it's definitely helped me understand that it's okay to be human. Um, it's okay to have bad days. Um, you know, it, it's okay to just take a step back and, 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 and sleep, you know, um, it's, it's okay to, um, to be vulnerable. And, you know, these are all things that, you know, you're, you, you're, you're told that you, you have to present yourself as this, this particular person and in, in, in this particular way, um, you know, women are always being asked about work-life balance. You know, there is no work-life balance either, <laughs> either you're working or you're lifing and, you know, you try to figure it out, but there's never necessarily a balance, I think, between, between the two. So, um, so, but being, but making sure that you do live your life and making sure that self-care is an absolute critical part of your life helps you be a better, a better entrepreneur. Excellent. So in closing, Regina, if you think over your life and career and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be and what would you say? Um, I definitely thank my dad. Um, 
he was a lot of things. And um, I would thank him for being an amazing example of um, love and support, unconditional support. And that's it. And that's it. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Now tell us how we can support you. Tell us, uh, tell everyone your website and social media and anything else that you want us to know. Of course, I'll have links to everything, but let us know. Sure. So Tress Noir, T-R-E-S-S-E-N-O-I-R-E.com. When you visit our website, you can sign up to get our newsletters and you'll get $10 off your first appointment. Mm. Uh, Definitely feel free to tell a friend to tell a friend in the New York area, Philadelphia, DMV. Um, And we're running a back to school promotion on Instagram. So when you hashtag the word Tress U, Tress University, Uh, We're giving away a free prize pack from Cantu Beauty. So definitely make sure to sign up to follow us on Instagram and enter the contest. Excellent. On Instagram, you're Tress Noir also, right? Yep. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all the same. Fantastic. Regina, thank you so much. Again, I'm so happy we were able to make this happen. It's good to talk to you and hear your whole story. Thank you so much, Elaine. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Now, before you go, what's a parting piece of advice from you to our listeners about anything? Be your whole authentic self and do it your way. Don't let other brands, other people, other bloggers, whatever, you fo- you follow your path. It's uniquely created just for you. Excellent. Regina, hold on just a second. Sure. All right. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Regina. Regina, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Now, to find out more about Regina and Tress Noir, make sure you go to supportissexypodcast.com and then just search Regina R-E-G-I-N-A, and her show notes page will pop up with all of the links, the resources, how to follow and get in touch with Tress Noir, and to book your appointment. Supportissexypodcast.com. Go to the top and search Regina. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for being here. You know I appreciate you. If you have not already, I would love for you to leave a review for the podcast. If you love it, let me know. Tell me what you think. I'd love a five-star review, but any feedback is appreciated. So please take, it takes like a minute, maybe two minutes, just to leave me a review. I would love to hear from you. And I'm reading the reviews each week. So let me know what you think, what I can do better, and if there's any other way that we can support you. All right. So again, thank you for being here. And now until next time, you know what to do. Go out there and create something sexy and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.